Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining our um, webinar. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this will be the fourth uh, session uh, of our inspiring series of webinars. Um, I would like to thank you for attending this session. Uh, the topic of today will be about uh, edutainment and digital media to challenge social norms and advance gen gender justice and women's rights in the Middle East and North Africa region. My name is uh, Mohammed Shablak, and I am the Media and Communications Officer at the Regional Gender Justice Program based in Beirut, Lebanon. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Uh, the speakers will start in a bit. Uh, I will be giving now a brief introduction and some technical tips to have a smooth session, and then I will introduce the series and the topic today. I have to apologize for the technical problem which we faced uh, today. Um, sadly, we will be a little bit late. I hope um, you don't mind. Uh, so I will give uh, a few uh, technical tips for running a smoother session. Uh, you will not need a microphone. Uh, please uh, click on tools and run, and run your audio setup wizard. Configure your headphones to be able to hear. Uh, the moderators and speakers only will be the ones who will have a um, uh, microphone. Uh, also, please uh, ensure that you press on talk whenever you want to talk. That, that note is for the moderators and the speakers uh, in order to limit the background noise. The session will be recorded and posted online, and it will be then trans transcribed into Arabic. If you face any technical issues, please click on my name, Muhammad Shiblak, on the chat box and type your question in the private chat box. This will send me a private message. If you wish to write something for everybody else, uh, please use the room titled room. This is the public room. We apologize in advance for voice delays, cuts due to low internet connections, so please bear with us, as this is something that we cannot control much. It might also take some time for us to, uh, to, to load the slides. You can use the smiley feature right under your name to express your emotions, feelings during the presentation. We will ask you to click on the upload, upload button after each presentation as a thank, thank you to our speakers. Uh, as this is our fourth webinar, our aim is to learn, develop, and adapt accordingly. So we'll be having a uh, Q&A session at the end of this webinar where, we'll be, where we will be collecting your uh, uh, questions, which you type in the chat box, and we'll be directing them to the, to the right or appropriate uh, speakers. As we have participants from various regions we have a plenty, who have plenty of knowledge, we would like to, th to give the floor to other participants who, who would like to share their, um, their experience in this. So please um, feel free to type your, your, uh, your comments in the chat box. The inspiring series of webinars, um, we started this series of webinars uh, with an aim of creating an interactive space that brings together conceptual thinking and practical examples of, of advancing gender justice and women's rights, especially in the MENA region. With this series, we strive to inspire, foster collaboration, and joint advocacy. Also, we, we aim to acquire new knowledge and share good practices and lessons learned on gender justice. The purpose of this series is to bring together practitioners as well as experts and scholars in the fields of gender influencing and advocacy. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the speaker's own and do not necessarily reflect, reflect the viewers of Oxfam. Um, why this web webinar? Recent years have witnessed increasing trends of online campaigning and advocacy for social justice issues. This trend has utilized the rapid development of the information and communication technologies, wider access to internet, and the increase in the smartphone usage worldwide. With a single click or swipe on a smartphone, users do not only receive the latest video or call for action, they can also donate money 
recruit their friends and spread the word among their social circles. Realizing the importance for such campaigns, nonprofits are now allocating budgets to produce moving videos and shareable graphics to have more engaging content. We have witnessed campaigns documenting the plight of Yazidi women in Iraq, videos encouraging the public to demand an end, an end to forced marriages, and platforms for reporting and tracking incidents of sexual harassment in the streets of Egypt and Beirut and Lebanon. All of these are examples of how digital media is used to engage online users to take actions. With platforms like Avaz and Change.org, anyone can now create petitions and recruit others and millions to take actions. Um, before we move to our first speaker, let me just give you a brief introduction about the speaker's backgrounds. Uh, our first speaker will be Asma Gedera. Asma is a gender advocate, collaborative strategist, and community builder. She is specialized in the impact of social innovation enabled by digital technology in, in, in innovative, innovative communities that emerge in societies, in societies especially in developing countries. After a brief career in consulting, she changed life and spent the past four years working with entrepreneurs, artists, social change networks around the world with a focus in the Middle East and North Africa region. She, she writes speeches, organizes and facilitates conferences, programs, and workshops. Asma is a digital nomad. She dedicates her time exploring the links between gender, Gen digital feminism and the new economy and creative communities by leading the Bimitragil project for the Womendi Foundation, being a we share connector and developing her hypergender project. The second speaker for this webinar will be Sara Murad. Sara is an assistant professor of media studies and program coordinator of the Gender and Women's Studies Initiative at the American University of Beirut. Sara works at the intersection of media and cultural studies, feminist political and social theory, and queer studies. Her current research explore, explores the intersections of gender, sexuality, and media in the formation of identities, subcultures, and counterpublics. Sara received her PhD for Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Her work has appeared in the International Journal of Communication, Critical Studies in Media Communication, the Journal of Communication Inquiry, and Jadalia. Our third speaker will be Elise Aghazarian. She is the editor of Love Matters Arabic. She grew up in East Jerusalem and holds, holds an MA in Social Sciences from the University of Amsterdam. She has worked in Palestinian NGOs and taught also facilitated courses related to Arab society, social change, and social movements in Bir Zayed and Bethlehem universities in the West Bank. She is currently, linked, she is currently based in the Netherlands and is specialized in tailoring social, cultural, academic, and sexual and reproductive health and rights themes into Arabic. Uh, apologies for the introduction, if the introduction was too long. I will now give the floor for our first speakers for, tonight, for today. Um, Asma, you have the uh, floor to, to present your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank can you. Can click on talk? Yeah. Do you hear me? I clicked on talk. Hello? Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. So, yeah, it's great to be uh, among you. And uh, thank you, Mohammed, for the introduction. Just a little bit more background before I start my presentation as this um, Webinar is actually uh, an activity that we prepared jointly with Oxfam since we have been partnering this whole year with the Womancy Foundation through our Revival program that I will tell you a little bit more about later. And 
um, this is an example of the type of activities joining different organizations working on a similar topic using uh, different tools. So I hope uh, after our discussion we can also have a look at uh, how this type of collaboration can um, can happen more in the future and can have more impact. Um, so I'm, I've been working with the Women C Foundation for uh, a year now on, on a program called Zimitrago that we can translate work 100 men in English, although I don't really like this uh, translation because it comes from a wordplay in Egyptian. And um, the, the concept uh, of this program is to use edutainment and new media to try to have an impact on and change behaviors on uh, how people perceive women's role in society and their rights as well. So just a couple of words about the foundation, maybe before. Um, so like the Women's Foundation exists now for over 10 years and we do a lot of different programs around the world, especially in uh, uh, emerging countries to uh, using innovation and innovative ways of tackling gender discrimination. So we have like a fellowship, Women Change Makers Fellowship in Brazil and uh, in India as well to uh, select, uh, and our call for application is actually open, to select uh, uh, a profile from, from, uh, from great women change makers and mentor them during the whole year, introduce them to our network and so on. Um, we have launched Rajanita in, uh, in Palestine and we have also have a great program, for example, to teach uh, young girls how to code in Afghanistan. Uh, so Dimya Sagul is our regional program in, in the whole region and basically the concept is that uh, we're using a fiction theory, so uh, storytelling through the media to, uh, to try to illustrate the different problems that women face um, in society in many Arabic countries. So, like the idea is that we had a first season that was an uh, an audio an audio show, and then this second season that was broadcast this year was an uh, online cartoon. So it's like a, a kind of a innovative, fun way to tackle uh, to tackle issues that are really usually addressed in a more serious way, uh, because our uh, aim is to reach like a younger population. So the concept of the program and why I, uh, uh, it's important to, to talk about it today uh, within our topic is that um, it doesn't only use uh, online digital uh, activity or media, but it also uses a combination of different, like of um, multimedia, multimedia tools and approach as we are, when we broadcast online, we also have like uh, um, media talking about us on the radio and we want to reach mainstream TV but we also combine it with a series of real life events and debates and this webinar being one of them at the crossroads of, uh, uh, of digital activity and uh, real life discussion. So just a couple of words about the, uh, the first season. It was aired in 2014 uh, on the radio. Uh, I believe Mohammed uh, will share on the chat the different links so we, they're all available in SoundCloud. So we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of coverage of several million listeners and so on, and uh, a strong Facebook community where people started engaging a lot online. And um, the concept of the program is that we use we leverage kind of guest stars uh, to do the voice of the uh, of the hero and as well uh, the generic song. So the first year was Mona Zaki and uh, as our uh, as our hero um, Noha. And then Sergeant was doing the song. So it brought us various radio, but actually our audience uh, asked us to. Our main feedback was that audiovisual was actually more uh, more relevant for this kind of work because uh, our society is changing and um, moving forward to the to a more visual and uh, image content. So. This is how we conceived the series to Vimy uh, Saraga, where we chose to have more uh, a more online star, Ala Wardi. If you don't know him, he's like an Iranian Saudi uh, singer that did uh, is kind of very famous on YouTube because he does everything with his own voice, and he um, he was famous. He has been 
publishing this year a series of uh, uh, of songs showing the evolution of Arabic uh, Arabic music and uh, and the history. But uh, initially, has been also famous for uh, a song called No Woman No Drive, uh, inspired of course uh, a remix of No Woman No Cry by Bon Marley to criticize. Um, to criticize the ban of women driving in uh, in Saudi. Uh, so the the way we did uh, this uh, this second season and why we want to the, the challenge of the of this series is that we want to address the whole region, right? And the first season was really uh, Egyptian focused because Noha was Egyptian. Uh, our our hero was a journalist telling different stories about women. Uh, the challenge women face in society and how to overcome them. Um, so we decided to uh, crowdsource the topic online through our Facebook page uh, for the season two. And so we had like on our poll a script competition, but all online and with a uh, validated with a board of uh, of experts, different feminists uh, among them, uh, Mason Abe, and. Um, and we decided then to broadcast 10, ten episodes with our partner Lapis Communication that does the, the animation and um, and keep this uh, very multi-layer uh, strategy of being online, doing partnership with different media and, and uh, creative spaces to have debates and uh, uh, host roundtables and workshops. So we don't only talk about the topic, but we really like foster action. So the concept of the um, of this real of this round table is to um, to increase collaboration between different uh, different worlds that don't speak to each other, like feminist organizations or schools or NGOs or change makers and innovators, all these different people advancing gender. Um, gender balance in their way, but in very different different manners. Um, there is so, like, just um, for example, uh, online we partnered with Kharabish, which is like the uh, Arabic YouTube, the main Arabic YouTube platform uh, today. Uh, it has like uh, over like three million viewers online and. Uh, we partner with Harabish with Shahid, which is the equivalent of uh, Netflix. If we can move to the other slide, because we have some screenshots of uh, the different online uh, activity. We put, we published uh, our episode on uh, a website with a blog with subtitles. We had a Facebook page where we had a lot of engagement online with people commenting and reacting to the different topics. So we address topics like. Equality, women stuttering roads, women opinion, early marriage, women in divorce, political participation, um, and we reached like about two million viewers online on this different platform with very, very different, uh, with a very different background. So like most of our audience was young people, but uh, depending if it was Harabish or Facebook or Shahid, the country's viewers would change. Uh, and what we realized actually is that most of our viewers were men. So we have like a 60, 40 percent uh, gender balance between men and women, uh, with mostly young men between age 18 to 24 looking at, uh, looking to our episodes. So it's like pretty, uh, pretty nice success for a first cartoon series online. But we want to keep building on it. So the the idea that we are like this. Uh, small foundation partnering with a maximum of existing activists and networks. So, for example, uh, the outreach we had a partnership with Love Matters, and we did a, an event together. Um, we have like different media partnering, and then for the tour of events, um, we have. I will tell you a bit more about the tour in detail because it's uh, for us it's the key um, the key challenge to. To balance this online engagement with deep online conversations, so yeah, you can see that we have a couple of different, very, very various partners from festivals to um, media, TV, radio, like BBC, and um, and online platform, as I mentioned, Love Matters or Harabish, and so on. But also like networks, uh, like uh, 
we're speaking to networks like Make Sense, like uh, WeShare and stuff like that to be present at existing conferences and festivals about innovation and new media and tackle the topic of, um, of women empowerment and uh, gender balance. So I will just mention uh, briefly our tour of events uh, because we we organized a tour of events called the Vime Saragol Tour and we've been to if we can move to the slide with the R, like with the map. That would be great. Thank you, perfect. So, um, thank you, Mohammed. <laughs> uh, so we had in, we broadcasted this year in, um, from uh, during the month of Ramadan in September as well uh, on Harabish and Shahid and our platform. And then we did a series of events all uh, in, uh, in probably uh, in about eight, eight or nine countries, from Morocco to Tunisia, Syria, Egypt, uh, Lebanon, France as well, um, Bahrain. So the the idea is that uh, every every event that we put together in partnership with a specific uh, with a specific space or organization addresses a specific topic um, linked to our series. So we have like a screening, then followed by uh, a panel discussion with activists, with a blend of activists and innovators about the topic. So for example, in, in Rabat, we had an event about uh, new, the impact of new media on um, women's political participation. And so we had like uh, some uh, women that were like for a long time in the parliament and more like old school kind of uh, activism and uh, new um, a young, uh, a young political activist who was explaining to us how she uses new media to have uh, to reach more more, uh, more people and so on. So, and at the same time in Cairo we had uh, an event to, uh, with Love Matters about sexual harassment and, um, and violence against women and more focused on sexualities and bodies but I believe uh, our two speakers are going to focus a bit more on that. Uh, what we noticed, and uh, the I think the, the strategy of this um, of this program is that with only with smaller audiences we can have a, a real impact. So um, I don't know if it's a challenge that I would like to raise with the audience and the speakers as well, but uh, the majority like. In general, the problem that we have is that we are very good at talking and organizing events and attending them and doing workshops, but then how do we follow up? Uh, how do we measure our impact? Um, it's a couple of challenges that I wanted to, uh, to, to raise uh, within our webinar. For example, like this webinar itself, um, how can we ensure that our online uh, campaigning and the digital activities have an impact beyond the discussions and the figures? Because what, what is happening in the public space and the like uh, digital space is is amazing and it's it's a leap. But then, how do you translate it in the um, in the public physical space? Because there uh, there's nothing new. There is no uh, very little public space to, to discuss. Now they're emerging more and more, especially following the, um, following the uh, revolution with the Arab Spring. Uh, you have more creative spaces, artistic spaces, uh, co-working spaces, networks, trying to actually raise the discussion, but how do we, um, how do we manage to bring in people that are not familiar to uh, the gender or feminist conversation to shift their, their mindset and attitudes because that's what we're looking for. So how do you reach a more remote audience with this real life conversation that can really have an impact? Uh, so far our own strategy has been to um, invite, organize like of course do public events, but who shows up? It's uh, a mix of activists, uh, artists, people who are curious, uh, feminist organization, so basically people who already work on that so we can train them and discuss and see how we can create a collaboration and use this tool that we have as an educational tool 
so they can reach their own uh, remote audience. But yeah, the the major thing is how we can um, we can get people to talk, get more people to act, and not only uh, um, not only uh, just be present, but follow up and take actions. So this is something that we try to to do for the season three. Um, as a conclusion, just a couple of words because um, we're preparing the, the season three of uh, Vimeo Toggle to have a more um, an animation that is more reality based with the uh, real stories and scenarios closer to the reality and also like the um, the drawing and the style would be more like Valtuk Bashir which is uh, uh, more popular in the region and the world I would say. So we are going to host like a creative hackathon with the creative teams from Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Saudi, mixing scriptwriters, digital creatives, and NGO during three days. So they come up with scenarios that actually talk to people. And um, we also want to involve men more strongly with partnering with Abad and Somundo that have uh, programs like Program H and Program Ra. I'd be happy to tell you more about it if you have questions, but try to uh, since our audience is mainly men, actually, and not women, we want to find a way to engage them more using also uh, a, get, a strategy of guest stars, not very famous people, but uh, online um, figures that talk to young people that they can identify to and they can relay our message. And yeah, um, engage more with school and the creative community because they have uh, a strong impact especially in the uh, in peri-urban areas that are uh, more remote and with less uh, access. And finally, a study that we're going to do with uh, Oxfam as well on the impact of the multimedia program. So yeah, uh, for me that's all. I would be very happy to hear uh, our other speakers and then to also debate on the challenges that we face with our different ways to address um, to address gender justice through new media. Thank you, Asma, for uh, presenting Bimi Tragel. Uh, maybe in the meantime, Mohammed uh, fixes his mic. If anyone has a spontaneous question, feel free to ask it. No, excuse me. Can anyone hear me? Um, I was saying, I was thanking Asma for presenting Dimitri Aigel, uh as an inspiring project uh, which is changing attitudes and behaviors in, uh, in our region. Um, also, I have shared links to, the, uh, to this project in the chat box so that uh, our participants know more about it. Um, also, if anyone has questions for Asma, please type them in the chat box. In the meanwhile, I will give the floor to Sarah Murad to talk to us to talk to us about claiming public space, women's bodies, and the digital descent. Thank you, Muhammad, and thank you, Asma, for the presentation. Um, I'm very excited to be on this panel with um, practitioners. So. Wait, so my voice is low again. Is it better now? Okay. So I was saying I'm very excited to be on a panel with um, practitioners. I'm going to provide, my presentation is going to provide a more sort of conceptual framing um, for some of the issues that you, um, you know, probably dealt with in your own work. Um, and so as my title suggests, I'm going to be talking about um, how different modes of digital descent have allowed for a new visibility for women's bodies 
and a new visibility of um, violence against women and their bodies um, in public space. And thinking about how digital media itself has redefined um, what we think of when we think about public space. So to walk you through the, um, the presentation, I'm going to start with the case of Alia El Mahdi from Egypt. Um, as it's, um, it raises some, some interesting questions for us to grapple with, then I will move to um, a comparative uh, sort of um, analysis with um, two campaigns, digital campaigns, one in Latin America, one in the US, and then I will end with um, the case of Article 522 uh, criminalizing, I'm sorry, the above the criminalization basically around the criminalization of, of rape and we'll talk more about that later on. So I want to start with um, Alia Al Mahdi. In October of 2011, um, Alia Al Mahdi was 20 year old at the time, posted a photo of herself on her blog Diary of a Rabbit, wearing nothing but thigh high black stockings, red satin slippers, and the red flower in her hair. The photograph received uh, 1.5 million hits within a week of its posting, drawing condemnations from liberals and conservatives um, in Egyptian society, but also in, in, from other Arab countries. And the photo, importantly, was posted in the period that was leading up to the first post-Mubarak parliamentary election which is why the public discourse it triggered, and it triggered a lot of responses um, that circulated both in mainstream media and on social media. Um, that public discourse is very telling. And um, I think that the strong reactions that her digital image um, elicited uh, in this particular revolutionary moment tells us something about um, the normative perceptions of women's bodies and their appearance in public. If we can move to the next slide, Mo. So, as I was saying, her digital nudity informs our understanding of normative perceptions of women's bodies and their appearance in public, but it also tells us something about new forms of dissent that are enabled by digital media technology and um, about the accessibility to the public sphere of new social actors, um, such as a 20-year-old student in this case, through new channels of communication. Commenting on her um, basically photographs in a 2013 interview, so a couple of years after the posting of the initial photographs, uh, Alia does an interview with French magazine Ed, and now she's a refugee in a small town in Sweden. And in that interview, she explains that she has always been a rebel. So she says, at first, I posted this photo on my blog. I've always loved breaking the rules, going out of the track. The proof, my successive blogs all included the word rebel in their title. So I posted this photo on my blog to break the rules once more. And then she explains, you know, her choices. She says, I retouched it to be black and white, to draw viewers' attention to my red slippers and the flower. Um, and I picked the flower because my mom used to say it was a bit too much. But then she also says, I wore these slippers in um, homage to Iranian women to whom the mullahs had forbidden lipstick and red shoes, and that's all. And then she says how suddenly, you know, she posted this image thinking that maybe she was going to be summoned by the police, but then suddenly this image becomes what she calls a planetary event. And she says even better because I actually wanted to um, uh, denounce discrimination that all women suffer from, including Egyptian women, through the posting of this photograph. So, and then he did break the rules, and you know, in light of the broader theme of um, changing norms and breaking norms, she did break the rules. She appeared naked in public, um, inviting millions to gaze at her body. Next slide, Mo. But beyond her nudity, the transgressive edge of her act is in the creative control 
she has over the photograph and its, and its distribution. So she was facing the camera and gazing straight at us, and um, her genital area was exposed. And the color scheme that she selected was also um, you know, curated by her to draw maximum attention to the symbolic red accessories that she chose to wear. So that this is not only about female nudity, uh, but about the conscious display of one's body that transgresses the norms of femininity in public. And this leads to the second point, which is that what allows this carefully curated self-display is the media technologies themselves at Al Mahdi's disposal. So whether it's the camera she uses, the blog and the social media, um, they're all instrumented in the creation and the dissemination of Aliya's image beyond the confines of her bedroom. In this regard, it's important to note that media blurs the boundaries between the private and the public realm, turning a young woman's body in her bedroom into a public stage, sorry, turning her body into a public spectacle and her bedroom into a public stage and then making a planetary event out of a selfie. So think about how new this phenomenon actually is. And so the significance of media success display became up for debate and interpretation. And this revealed the different um, opinions that people held about the place of gender and revolutionary politics, the status and role of women and their bodies, and the forms of social dissent in the age of new media. So these questions, and very pertinent questions, were up for debate um, in newspaper columns and op-eds, um, on television shows, on social media platforms, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and so these um, three, basically, um, findings uh, that we have around this image tells us something about the politics of, the, of representation in the age of um, new media technology. And here it's, um, um, it's important to point out some of the characteristics of digital media, which is that they, um, and this is something in, in, in your own work, Asma, and um, in these, I'm sure you deal with this, you think about this, uh, digital media constitutes visible platforms for both expression, but also for access to a wide audience and often unexpected audiences. And they enable the formation of what we call in, in media studies networked publics. Um, so individuals that are connected by virtue of the digital media. Um, and so uh, it is through these network publics that you have the distribution of alternative discourses on gender and sexuality. Um, and this is where you see the collective construction and formulation uh, of counter narratives with new discourses to think about. Um, um, gender, women's bodies, women's agency. And finally, there is a dialectical relationship between digital discourse and social reality. And so when you talk about impact and measuring impact, um, you know, we can think about how um, digital discourses get uh, picked up by mainstream media um, uh, that adopt then these new counter frames. And by doing that, they influence public opinion on certain topics. But we even also have institutions and individuals that then following, you know, the circulation of these discourses that start maybe reconsidering certain behaviors um, or upholding them, you know, in the face of opposition. And here it's, um, uh, it's interesting to look at um, two cases, uh, one from the U.S. and one from Latin America. Um, next slide, Mom. So in September 2014, following the high-profile domestic abuse case following a football player, an American football player, Ray Rice, uh, Beverly Gooden, who's um, an HR manager in North Carolina, so just a you know, regular person, wrote the following tweet. I tried to leave the house once after an abusive episode, and he blocked me. She's referring to her husband. He slept in front of the door that entire night. And then she adds the hashtag, why I stay. So through that hashtag, um, basically, she told her friends and family and complete strangers that she had been a victim of an abusive marriage that she never actually reported to the police. And she formulated her response, so using why I stayed, um, uh, 
that phrase because mainstream media were basically ignoring the domestic abuse case and focusing on why the football player's girlfriend stayed with him despite um, the violence against her that was caught on camera and leaked to the public. And within the first 24 hours of um, the hashtag's existence, users tweeted under that hashtag more than 92,000 times. So you see how, again, it elicited a very strong reaction. Um, and next slide. And in an interview later on with NPR for National Public Radio, um, the woman who posted the hashtag explained it was like we all just kind of greeted each other with this familiarity of violence, which is really sad, but also really hopeful. And this allows us to think, so the way she's talking about sharing the familiarity of violence with others and greeting others, it says us something about what we have come to call hashtag activism. Um, and it helps us grasp that phenomenon. And when we talk about hashtag activism is when basically a bunch of tweets are tagged with the same phrase with the goal of bringing about a particular change or moving things in a particular direction. And hashtag activism is a form of what some scholars have called discursive activism, which is directed at promoting new grammars, new social paradigms to which individuals, collectivities, and institutions interpret social circumstances and devise responses to them. And again, I heard resonance of this in Asma's presentation um, and in the kind of project that they're putting out there with Bini Kragel. So here, in this case, victims of domestic abuse take control of the narrative about their experiences, and their public tweets shift the discourse away from victim blaming. And in this regard, they simultaneously, I think, normalize and denormalize domestic abuse. So how do they normalize domestic abuse? They share and they aggregate their personal stories that are previously you know, separate, isolated, unknown. So they share them and, um, um, and they talk about the physical and the psychic abuse that is common in society, but that we think you know, is exceptional. So they de-exceptionalize it. Uh, domestic violence, showing its frequency. And then on the other hand, they denormalize domestic violence as well because by collectively, um, you know, speaking out against domestic violence and sharing the similarities of their experiences, they circulate a counter frame. So um, another way to interpret reality, to disrupt what is seen as, you know, a normal kind of violence against women. So they disrupt the normalcy of the everyday, you know, violence, whether it's small, whether it's big, whether it's physical, whether it's psychic, um, they, they interrupt its uh, normalization. So hashtag feminism is important to understand today um, because it allows for the formulation, as I said, of collective narratives that we interpret something like gender violence. And they have what we call, you know, real life material effects. The second case I'm going to look at um, briefly is one from Argentina. So the case of Ni Una Menos. So in Argentina, also a hashtag campaign brought national attention to the endemic problem of violence against women and the violence that often leads to their murder. So Latin American countries are known for a really high incidence of, and rate of violence and murder of women. Um, and this is, you know, according to statistics and reports. And in October 2016, so um, a few months ago, women took to the streets in Argentina, and then in different Latin American cities, similar protests were staged against gender violence and what they referred to as femicides or the murder of women. And the demonstrations were recognized on social media under the hashtag Ni Una Menos, or Not One Less, which is in reference to the victims of um, male perpetrated violence. And hundreds of thousands of women went to the streets, and hundreds of thousands of women had gone to the streets a year before following the murder of um, young girls, school girls in that case. And um, these um, protests were organized by female journalists, and that's an interesting point in, in, that, uh, you know, in thinking about this. 
And one of the journalists who uh, reports on cases of gender violence, when she was reporting on, you know, the high-profile cases, she tweeted, they're killing us. So if you can go to the next slide. And it's that tweet that started, you know, this um, widespread campaign, uh, not one less. And according to The Guardian, so here we're seeing at how mainstream media covers uh, these hashtag uh, campaigns. So according to the British newspaper, um, the journalist tweet spread like wildfire. And women started using it to um, talk about uh, gender violence in public. And um, so what happened a year ago happened again following the murder of another girl um, a, a, a couple of months ago. Um, and people went out to the streets. They were mobilized asking for a better government action and greater public awareness on the issue. So on the one hand, you know, you have something like a tweet, so a way to phrase or formulate um, something that articulates gender as an axis of um, violence, but it also interpolates. So it, it calls on women um, to recognize themselves as victims of structural violence, right? It's not just one or two or, you know, your husband or your brother or this stranger. It's a structural issue. And they call on them to mobilize as members of, um, you know, a counter public. So an opposition or the public that goes against the norms of the day. And finally, I want to end with, um, so building on these um, ideas about hashtag feminism, about what we're calling discursive activism, so activism that changes discourse. Um, I want to end with um, the Undress 522 um, hashtag campaign that was launched by um, the youth-based NGO Abad. And so this campaign was launched to abolish Article 522 of the Lebanese Penal Code. And this article states that if a man rapes an unmarried woman, he can avoid prosecution if he marries the victim. And this is uh, you know, thought of in order to protect the dignity of the victim and the honor of her family. So this is you know, norms codified and laws. This is law. And under the hashtag undress522, um, the campaign included streets, protests, and billboards, and also a viral video that some of you may have seen that shows a beaten, bloodied woman being bandaged into a wedding dress, so the transformation of her bandages into a bridal gown. Um, and these visuals were prominently featured on the organization's um, uh, social media accounts and websites, and here you see a snippet from their Facebook page. In addition, so last week we had a parliamentary committee that met and approved to overturn the law. So on December 7th, the committee approved the, the, the abolishing of the law. And then following this decision, I launched an online petition that we can see in the next slide. Um, and, and through this petition, they, they want to collect signatures in support of the repeal to put pressure on the Lebanese parliament which will be voting on the committee's recommendation. And um, basically, they say, with every signature, we tear away another thread of Article 522. Together, we undress 522. So here, we see hashtag activism at work, which tells us something that it's not, it's a global phenomenon. It has, you know, specific contextual elements and, and um, you know, as you see in the language that is used and the cultural references, um, and it is very local, but it's also a global phenomenon. And so the campaign here exposes the absurdity of the law that remedies rape with marriage, but it also reframes the law, not in terms of safeguarding a woman's honor, but as a cover-up of sexual violence. So here we see, um, you know, the counter-frame at work, the reinterpretation at work. The counter-frame it provides, through the metaphor of undressing, is conveyed through uh, the bloody, you know, bandages as bridal gowns. So that's metaphor. And uh, if we follow the campaign's discourse, what's shameful then becomes the law itself, not the fact of being raped. This is an important 
you know, um, uh, switching of, of that discourse. So by lifting the burden of shame from the rape victim and placing it on the law itself, the campaign provides a counterframe to understand sexual violence. And in this way, it denormalizes um, the legal norms, basically. Um, and, and that campaign gets picked up by mainstream media. The video uh, gets broadcasted on television, so it doesn't only circulate online. And yes, we can't say that it's the campaign that led the committee to basically make a decision to abolish the law, but the campaign definitely created public buzz um, that made the issue much more visible to the public. And I think it made something that otherwise wouldn't have been, you know, seen or thought about. Um, and it turned the vote itself, which is what's interesting, it turned the vote, the parliamentary vote, into a, an anticipated event. And I think, you know, this is when you talk about discursive activism, this is what you must keep in mind. And so to conclude, We can say that digital media allows for the appearance of gender and sexual violence in both its material and symbolic forms in public. So we saw how digital media can turn, can be used by people to, to show, you know, with Ali al-Mahdi, very private settings, um, to show one naked body to millions of viewers. So we know that it has that capability. So it exposes gender and sexual violence in the case of, you know, people talking about their domestic abuse in public. It also aggregates and circulates dissenting voices in the, in the digital sphere, which opens up new possibilities to transform discourse on women's bodies, but also on, on gender and sexual violence. So people start talking. Um, and, and this is something that also Asma talked about, you know, how people reacted to, to that um, series. And finally, by making otherwise isolated and personal experiences connected and visible, digital media users intervene public discourse on violence, harassment, rape, and shame, and therefore provide um, alternative ways to think about social reality. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I will now give uh, the floor for Elise uh, to talk about uh, her work in Love Matters Arabic. Hi. Thanks, guys. Great to see how our different experiences overlap in a way. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So sexual and reproductive health, an interesting, important, and sometimes challenging topic, right? To introduce Love Matters, um, Love Matters Arabic, also known as al hut Thaqafa, is actually the first comprehensive online Arabic-speaking platform for youth age... Next slide, please. So it's, it's uh, no, the former one, please. Uh, former slide, yeah. So al hub Thaqafa, or Love Matters Arabic, is actually an online platform for youth aged between 18 to 35, but we have more visitors sometimes in other ages as well. It discusses topics related to sexual and reproductive health, including fun topics like love, pleasure, and in intimacy. This is done in an open, non-judgmental, user-friendly, and gender-sensitive gender manner, and also culturally tailored to our audience. Uh, next slide, please. Love Matters Arabic is a kind of community. It includes international, Egyptian, and Arabic followers, as well as writers, activists, doctors, bloggers, and different specialists. And these experiences are shared among the different Global Love Matters platforms that are spread in five regions and websites that cover six different languages, which, which provides us with different experiences from different countries. Next slide, please. So how was Love Matters Arabic designed? 
It started by Radio Netherlands Worldwide, or RNW Media, in 2013. Focus groups took place in Egypt, and uh, we, we checked what Egyptian news think about their information sources. And in parallel to that, we observed online behavior around these topics. Uh, following slide. So Love Matters Arabic was officially launched in 2014. Since then, we have around 6 million users and 15 million page views over the website. And over YouTube, we have over 15 million views so far, as in addition to our Facebook and Twitter followers. One observation so far is that, and what we noticed when we started the website, is that in most Arab countries, there is no sexual education at school. So youth are getting married at a relatively older age, and they are engaging in outer course, and sometimes unprotected intercourse. And this is leading to unplanned pregnancy and STDs. Last year, we received so many questions about genital warts that both married and non-married people had contracted. And a lot of people are really scared and terrified. They don't know what to do about it. And these are topics that people are really um, think uh, three times before discussing it with people offline. It's really hard. Especially that a lot of people do not trust local doctors and feel embarrassed of them. Or people living in villages get scared from gossip or being judged. So what do they do? They go online for answers. Next slide, yeah. So online, what do they get? Or at least what we saw. They see either sensationalist news sites, um, and these do not always provide reliable information, or religious websites, and they have different interpretations and facts, so they get somehow lost in interpretation. Or you see discussion forums, or mostly pornography, which we notice that the youth are using as a source of information, on gender and sexuality. But in pornography, we often see one-sided or violent conceptions to sexuality in a lot of sites. And this also conditions them to certain body shapes, not to mention that they sometimes make them feel they're living in a fantasy world away from real life or real relationships. And sometimes young youth uh, tend to adopt um, more violent conceptions of sexuality. Now, in contrast to that, uh, to give you an idea of our site and how it was built, to the right you see uh, direct information on subjects from A to Z, things like how does pregnancy happen, what is harassment exactly, what is the body, the female body anatomy, the male body anatomy. I grew up in a school in East Jerusalem, and we never studied anything about the female body or even subjects like pregnancy at school, the teacher used to skip them. At a time when a couple of my, my classmates were already engaged at age 16. Um, in the website, we also cover topics like articles, reports, weblogs on different subjects. In addition to that, we have myth, myth busters where we present uh, an information and what are the myths about it, the kind of wrong medical information. Using Google Analytics, we can also check what people are looking for and develop content accordingly. Google provides us with a good chance to observe clicks and trends and, and develop content based on what people are searching for. Uh, we also see what are the terms they're looking and using. So we also have things like Q&A, self-tests, uh, love quotes, comics, and pro and con debates. Many people ask me, what if followers impose a conservative perspective? Many people, as we see on the website, they sometimes try to impose um, a kind of very conservative or derogatory um, concept or information. But that is positive, I would say, because when people go out and write them um, and we correct that information or we take part in the discussion, 
or provide the uh, proof of another biological information that contradicts what they're saying, that's when change starts taking place. So, for example, we often come across people who say, a 30-year-old woman cannot get married because she cannot get pregnant. So we provide them with stories of women who did actually uh, get married after 30 and get pregnant, and also biological information. So other people searching for that, do women getting married after 30 get pregnant, they come across our site when they search for it over Google. Former staff member Sarah Osman once interviewed a woman who had gone through breast cancer. She removed one breast, and after the surgery, she fell in love, got married, got pregnant, and breastfed the baby with only one breast. Um, so such a personal story challenges a lot of stereotypes. Next slide, please. We also developed a discussion board, and this is a written board where people could write their questions in public or private. It's not only questions, it's questions or what they're feeling and they need support. And they could get answers directly by three specialists who are working all throughout the day. And what we notice is that people know the answers sometimes, but they're too scared. And here we do not provide one information, but we offer different options and people could then think and reflect and see what is tangible based on their daily realities. And here we often see that uh, a lot of followers have this feeling of, oh, wow, you care, thanks for caring, we didn't know you would write back, or wow, I am relieved, my body looks normal, especially that many people are checking online and seeing different stories and really get scared about what is normal and what is not normal. And in our site, we try to offer this idea of difference. You don't have to be like everyone else. You could be different sometimes. So according to what we see, many men especially um, feel really insecure about their performance, which they somehow connect to their masculinity. Uh, they connect uh, their body image with their masculinity. And they often feel really insecure and tend to become, therefore, sometimes aggressive according to what they say. So moderators give them one-to-one -one confidence. And these are topics people feel more comfortable learning online rather than face-to-face. -face. And you, quickly, you can easily, quickly reach hundreds or thousands of people. Dealing with harassment, for example, involves talking about the body. You need to talk about sexuality, confidence, power relations. As so, that's something you can do easily online because you can reach many people who feel safer and more open on the digital sphere. Women also dare to say things they never say offline. Next slide. From all those uh, engagements and comments so far, we realized that a lot of youth in the MENA region feel extremely repressed, frustrated, and chained. Sometimes they feel they want to run away from everything. And they sometimes tell us even falling in love is prohibited. So they're feeling like they want to explode sometimes on different levels. And many are challenging and going through different battles. And they're searching for information and real support without being judged. For example, many women who have already been genitally mutilated or so-called female circumcision hear all those different campaigns against mutilation. But what they tell us is that sometimes they, this makes them feel powerless because then they get scared. Oh, so this means I want to enjoy intercourse. How can I enjoy it? Uh, what can I do? And here the counselors go in one, one direct discussions with them in written discussions, and we develop content or articles which uh, give them more the feeling of being active and different forms of pleasure. So far, we received dozens of letters, and, and this was something I saw a lot, dozens of letters from girls across the Arab world saying they are too scared to sport because they are afraid they this would break their hymen. And this is a reality they don't talk about at school or to their friends or to their moms. And many men told us that they had been taught that all women want 
uh, violent and rough intercourse, and they think there is one standard that applies to women. Many wives, and I'm saying about like um, thousands uh, of people so far who came to the site and wrote what they think, so this is based on what we're seeing. Many wives tell us they suffer from painful intercourse and go on years with that, leading to communication problems between couples. Many times the counselors say, listen, there is no one law, just ask her what she likes. And then, then this kind of dialogue takes place. Also, non-married women support each other in our forums and try to gain confidence by listening to each other. Next slide. Egyptian blogger Tasneem Sihid wrote an article in our site once saying, when I was a child, I was harassed and sexually abused. Yes, finally, I say it out loud. These events were on my mind all those years, but I never told anybody, not even my mom. So we somehow reached to the situation where people started coming out on certain sensitive topics. And this was a kind of process. We were in the beginning testing ground, and then gradually people started gaining trust, and then gradually coming out on on things they've gone through without feeling victimized or without feeling also uh, being forcing their positions. And this reminds me of hashtag activism that also um, Sarah talked about. Uh, for example, once Marwa Ma'moon, who used to be our Twitter coordinator, uh, made the hashtag um, entitled first time I was harassed. And a lot of people, including some celebrities, even novelist Ahdaf Swift, starting to, to, come in, to come out about the first time they remember they went through harassment. So this got picked up over Twitter and in mainstream media. Um, so this was very influential, we felt. Each week we have a different theme, and every now and then we take part in global international days uh, for example, together with WGNRR, or activities we also did with the uh, Womanity Foundation. So how did we reach to this kind of trust? How did we manage to reach to all these people and also um, get, get this kind of process? It, it's very much related to a, an approach that we started learning day by day. And we, we learned that one should not take language and tone of voice for granted. How do we get away with discussing about it is also related to the tone of voice. So what we learned is to avoid patronization or victimizing or oversimplifying the realities. It's based on respecting people's choices, lifestyle, religiosity. It, it, we also had to select friendly words around sexuality. We, we, it was a choice we made. People sometimes get too too shy to use the proper Arabic words related to the body. So we have to think carefully, what word do we use? Does it have a different connotation? Is it derogatory to a certain group? Is it gender friendly? Is it LGBT friendly? Is it pleasure oriented? Is it proper in Arabic? So we had to think, sometimes we spent a couple of hours around a certain words or concepts. Also, in Arabic, verbs use the male version in general. So we decided to use to address both males, females, and sometimes go in between uh, so that it would be also um, friendly to the LGBTQ community. Um, also, sometimes the text looks weird that way, but we still do it. Or sometimes we use the we form to avoid conjugations. Another thing we noticed, and this connects to what Asma and Sarah were saying, were saying, is that in Arab media, we often see this image of a woman and how she should look like, plastic surgery, um, this obsession with an insecurity with a certain role model in terms of looks. And in images and discourse, we try to endorse the idea of different kinds of beauty. Like, I think images also influence the way people think about beauty. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a process of uh, testing your boundary, con continuously listening, observing, and reflecting um, on what people are saying. Next slide. 
So what you do, for example, when you want to ex explain breast size difference in Arabic. So sometimes we use symbols, for example, fruits to refer to breasts. So it's like culturally friendly, but also um, a kind of symbol. Next slide. One useful tool as well was information over YouTube. So, for example, vlogger Alia Iged speaks on topics. For example, the first night, uh, wedding night, or the first intercourse experience. This film was watched over 4 million times. Uh, she made other films as well. For example, she made a film on how to test yourself for breast cancer. Now, a woman, when you explain to a woman how to test herself for breast cancer outside, uh, like offline, um, they may hear it from the uh, specialist, but sometimes they're shy to do it themselves. But here they just go to their rooms, put on the film, and follow this, the instructions over YouTube, and just feel comfortable in their own rooms doing it online. So um, one funny example was that we received sometimes things like this couple on their wedding night saying, I am now at my wedding night and my beloved husband and I are checking your site to get info, thanks. So this couple, they were like wondering how things should go and they just clicked it online. Or this woman who was infertile and she was so embarrassed to tell people and she thought she was infertile but the doctor online um, in the discussion board supported her and she finally managed to get pregnant. So thanks to Allah, I'm now pregnant. Many deep thanks also to you, she's saying. We even received, next slide, yeah. We even received um, positive comments from people in the Gulf or even people in Saudi Arabia, which we really appreciated and which was really encouraging for us. Next slide. So of course it does not stop here. It is important to network, to engage with the community and change makers, like our partnership with the Meet Rebels. We also have offline events every now and then, exhibitions, celebrities. We lately had Sadat and Y Crew singing a song, including gender in, in their music. Um, another event, offline event we did, um, was working with change makers. Next slide. So uh, sometimes working with a small group of change makers, this is a small group. It includes a doctor, it includes someone working in religious counseling, it includes students, um, student activists. And here, what we do is we, we did this activity together with the um, Jinsania Foundation, the Arab Forum of Sexuality, or Mrs. Safa Tamish. And here we shared our insecurities, our challenges, and we were trying to learn together and expand our knowledge in the field, also checking our own prejudices. So we were also checking what we're weak in, and we were trying to criticize ourselves and see how it feels like working on these different topics. And finally, uh, one last tip is that uh, utilizing storytelling is very helpful. In the International Day, um, in the International Week against for Access for Safe Abortion, uh, we were trying to raise awareness on unsafe abortion. And we did it through a, a story of a woman who had gone through the so-called under the ladder unsafe abortion. Here we notice that people judge you when you just throw out the information. But when you do it in a story form where they can emphasize with the targeted audience and try to step into their shoes, their attitudes sometimes change. So thanks, and I'm looking forward to discussing and taking part in common activities with you guys. This was from our Sadat and Y Crew event lately. Um, and finally, you see also our uh, website and uh, Facebook and Twitter address in the end. Here in the last um, presentation, in the last slide. Sorry, Alice, for some, for some reason that last presentation didn't, uh, didn't uh, It's okay, open. it was just our um, Facebook and uh, Twitter and website address. 
I will try to put them in, in the chat room now. Okay. So looking forward Thank to you, discussing Lisa. with you. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, our speakers. Uh, we will now move to the Q&A session. Uh, as, as mentioned before, if you have any question, please uh, write them in the chat room. Um, we have, um, we have a, a question for the three speakers. Um, so whoever would like to answer it, please uh, start. Uh, the question says, what do you think was the most effective in using digital media, and what uh, what was the least effective? So, uh, I think then this could be a, a strategy or a technology. Um, anyone would like to to share their uh, their view on the least or the most effective uh, digital campaign, um, digital activism to change uh, gender stereotypes, to change the narratives around uh, women's rights. Uh, uh, Muhammad, should we reply the questions you raised on the chat room, or should we reply? Um, may I reply your question? No, no. Uh, you can start by uh, you can start by uh, you know talking uh, talking uh, using the microphone. Yes. So uh, the question is the first one. What do you think was the most effective and the least effective uh, digital uh, tactic which was adopted in our region. Something which, um, which you think was uh, really engaging or something which you think was, um, on the contrary, was, uh, was not very well prepared or didn't, wasn't uh, built on studying the region, the language maybe, as you mentioned, uh, Elise. Um, the, it depends on the topics. So I think it depends on the topics. Yeah. So for example, on the subject of uh, in the International Day Against Homophobia, uh, not many people shared it. It was shared, but not largely. Whereas on, uh, the, the, um, on access to uh, safe abortion, that was shared more. So sometimes you get surprised at uh, why one thing works or another. It's also related to people people's uh, opinions or their daily realities or what they want or not to share over social media. We noticed also like doing self-tests as a form of um, awareness works very well. When you say check how much you know about, uh, we did this on check how much you know about abortion and, and then people um, reply the answers and then they see what answers they had were wrong. Um, so, so th uh, this was very effective, and we were surprised when you do self-test, it gets shared a lot. Also, hashtags do a lot, but it's within the hashtag community. You don't need reach a wider audience. Face through Facebook, sometimes you reach a wider audience. Thank you, Elise, for your input. Um, there is a question for uh, Asma. Um, Asma, can you please give us examples of controversial social uh, norms that Bimid Ragel discussed, and what was the reaction of uh, the audience to that? Um, yes, actually, the um, I would say the most uh, controversial topic that we had was uh, during the event that we hosted in Cairo in partnership with and hope so, uh, love matters. Um, because we had uh, initially the, the objective was to discuss um, to discuss the role of new media and uh, digital activism on uh, the fight against uh, violence against women. And uh, we actually interested talking a lot about FGM, uh, female genital mutilation, and uh, sexual harassment harassment as well and sexuality and the role of uh, gender roles in the marriage because we had speakers who were experts on these different topics. And uh, we had a very, very strong debate and uh, the, uh, I found the, the reactions of the audience very interesting because um, first, again, uh, and this is something that quite 
uh, surprised me uh, during all the events is that he, there is a there is a strong gender balance. There are men and women coming to these events and conversation. So, and older young, younger people. So in general, the audience is um, kind of agrees with the uh, with the point of view of the speakers, right? Defending, uh, of course, uh, women's dignity. But there was uh, there was one. Uh, I remember there was one guy in the audience, one man, uh, starting to question uh, the legitimacy, like the and the roots of FGM, uh, and uh, instead of the speaker uh, answering in a, in a in a very angry way, actually the audience, the rest of the audience, started debating with him and. Uh, Attacking his point of view, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a very gentle way. So there was always respect. So at the end, he kind of uh, agreed that what he said was uh, offensive. So that for me was a, a kind of controversial moment. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Yasmin. Um, she's asking when we are working with communities who are not very tech savvy, how uh, who, who also do not use the hashtag, so uh, maybe with uh, little internet ac access to internet, um, how do we reach them? So this, um, yeah, this is a challenging question. So how do we reach um, communities who are not uh, connected to internet or they don't have the uh, privilege to, uh, to access internet? So maybe how do we make the online offline? Uh, Asma, can you please share your contribution? Yeah, this is this is actually uh, our biggest challenge, Yasmin, because um, um, for our online, uh, like the first target of the program is uh, young people living in urban and peri-urban area, because uh, it's the uh, it's the more like the biggest part of the population, and it's, it's going to keep growing. So cities are going to be 80 percent, 80 percent of the people in the world in 10 years will all live in cities. So that's why we're um, targeting this population, but then even if we look at cities and uh, how can you reach the peri-urban area uh, where people are not privileged, don't have, are not tax savvy or don't reach, um, yeah, like don't consume internet in a very, um, very little way. I would say so far the, 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 the strategy and the idea that we adopt uh, is to try to to bring to our events and train uh, to the use of social media uh, different feminist organizations that are, I would say, more old school, so not tech savvy, not using new media for their campaigns and their program, but they are established for a while and they um, they have contact with uh, communities that are kind of left over. So the the major challenge today that I that I've that I strongly see is to kind of build this bridge between the young activists that are super tech savvy, do amazing things online, and bring massive uh, attention on specific topics, and then like the the more long-term uh, follow-up impact that requires work closely to this population. Just to give you an example, um, in Amman we had a, uh, so we had a screening and an e event and debate with the. Uh, with people from Oxfam, from other feminist organizations, young activists as well, and uh, um, and there was one girl uh, who uh, who has a space called the Jadal, which is like a creative space in a very um, uh, in downtown, so not a very uh, rich neighborhood, so still mixed, and they have a uh, many refugee uh, Syrian refugees living in this area. So they noticed that actually, since their space is open, they have many kids coming, and uh, sometimes, and the, the kids brought the mothers, and then they started discussing with the mothers. And uh, this girl realized that actually, uh, these women had never, never the opportunity to talk about their their condition as women. They don't even know that it's like not uh, normal, right? For them, being bitten is okay, uh, being mistreated is okay. It's just the way it works. They have to stay home and. Uh, they suffer from it, but they don't share it. So we started um, partnering with them to organize, uh, just to screen the, the episodes as a way 
to spark the conversation among these women and just to make them realize and uh, share among them uh, this, this problem because they, there is, they don't have uh, any access to public space. So in the future, the, for me, that's the, that, that is the, the best way to, to reach this population by using this super innovative tool uh, so we can like have at the same time the kids and uh, the mothers and so on aware, uh, being more aware of uh, of their own problems. I don't know if that answered the, the question, but uh, for me that's uh, that's a very good example. Yes. And also, it, uh, it's something which uh, which should we should consider while putting the strategy for such digital uh, campaign or such digital activity is to consider the um, uh, the outreach and uh, and how to make sure that uh, we are inclusive in our approach that uh, there is no barriers or at least we, we try to limit uh, the the language barrier um, in order to increase the outreach. And we have a question for Sara. Um, Sara, the question is, um, how can civil society organizations leverage digital tools and better use hashtag activism? <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Um, so um, one, I think, distinction that's important to make around this question is between, you know, spontaneous tweets that then become, you know, part of, a, of the campaign versus a hashtag that is designed by, you know, a, a known group or NGO. Um, and then that is released, you know, and with the hopes that it will generate further retweets and, and shares. So here we have two different uh, models. And I think when we look at an example like um, why I say <clears throat> about women reporting their personal experiences with domestic abuse, so it starts with one random person talking about this and sharing um, her experience and then it gets picked up and retweeted and retweeted and um, versus something like a bad uh, unread 522 campaign which looks very different and where it's you know an, an institutional structure that is, you know, and, and people within working within an organizational framework who sit together, who you know, talk with the donor, talk amongst themselves. You know, what's the best way to? Um, they plan a campaign basically. So I think the, the to, to you know the, the first part of that answer is that there's a distinction between um, these two different kinds, and I think spontaneity and the kind of bottom-up rather than top-down approach or um, um, or not approach necessarily but occurrence or um, formulation of, um, of what then becomes, you know, what starts as an individual um, statement and then becomes a larger collective narrative. Um, I think an element of, of the bottom-up approach is, um, I would say, um, more um, rooted in, in the social fabric or you know, in the society in which it emerges. But I also think that civil society organizations can do a good job in basically speaking the language of um, their respective societies. And I think um, the Abad campaign was uh, successful because it was, because of, you know, the, the wordplay, the metaphor. So basically the, the small details about the campaign, the idea itself um, helps it spread. And to add to this, and this is related to your previous question, they did a good job, they took into consideration the limitations of the digital sphere and 
you know, that the fact that it excludes a lot of people. So they went all out with billboards. And um, with uh, mainstream media appearances and, and the video appeared on local TV stations. And this obviously requires money. Um, and so that, you know, opens up a whole other in terms of how you can leverage this or how you can move it beyond the digital sphere. You need money. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I will move now to uh, the questions which was directed to uh, Elise. Um, if she can mention to us, uh, like she mentioned, the, Elise, you mentioned uh, dealing with harassment. How does Love Matters address digital sexual harassment? Um, do you get any uh, questions, um, any complaints, any concerns from your uh, uh, readers or viewers or audience? Uh, do you give them support on, on that, or is there any major trend? Uh, what are the response to, uh, to such uh, type of harassment online? Uh, thank you, Mohammed. This is a very good question. Uh, we actually developed content about that, so it's uh, called uh, Sex and the Internet, and how people, things people should be aware of. Especially that peop some people, uh, we, we, we do get many questions of people saying they were blackmailed. Um, especially with webcam, they get blackmailed. Uh, another thing, another harassment is that uh, some women get stalkers, both uh, men and women, but women get it more, uh, online stalkers. So we, we develop, um, we develop, we, we first respond to these people and we developed articles about that. But also on our, uh, on our forums, sometimes you get people who try to um, harass or uh, hurt other people or uh, try to post a spam. So uh, in this case, when people start, um, we, 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 we start telling them, you can't talk this way or uh, why, what, what, where is this coming from? Why do you think this? But when they really use like swearing words or try to annoy the, the women, we remove the comments. But also when someone is uh, saying something, um, women saying about like their sexual problems, you sometimes see uh, some men uh, trying to put their number and say, talk to me, and they keep posting it saying, talk to me, talk to me. So we delete these comments. Uh, uh, because they are also uh, harassing uh, even in our page sometimes. Um, yeah, so so far we didn't have, uh, we just had one film about uh, that, but we didn't, we we're planning of uh, developing more content. We, we So far we just have written content about this. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Um, I think if there's uh, no more questions, then we will uh, end this uh, session. I would love to uh, thank the sp three speakers for the time they put in preparing their presentations and sharing their knowledge with us. I will try now to summarize uh, what was uh, discussed in, um, in this webinar. So basically, we touched upon humanity's experience in using uh, edutainment and challenging gender social norms and stereotypes featuring the Mitragel animated series, raising questions about challenges to evaluate impact of digital, of such digital uh, initiatives. Our webinar also explored how the social and digital media is being used to challenge gender social norms and stereotypes, uh, starting with challenging the gender traditional paradigm of limiting women to the private sphere, to opening a new digital public sphere for women, and challenge sexual and gender violence against women using tools such as hashtag activism. Um, the webinar also talked about uh, Love Matters initiative, uh, the Arabic version of it, highlighting how the digital media provided the space to discuss gender and sexual education and improve access of information to topics that are considered controversial in the media region, highlighting the power of the personal uh, storytelling. I uh, would love to thank our esteemed uh, speakers, Sarah, Elise, and Asma, for their valuable contribution to this uh, webinar. 
And uh, thank you everybody for your participation. We hope you found this discussion interesting and fruitful. Uh, as mentioned uh, before, the session is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted online as a video. Also, we will provide an Arabic uh, interpretation for the session for those who would like. Uh, please let us know whether uh, you think uh, this um, in this session was uh, beneficial. I will share with you now a feedback uh, form which you can fill. Uh, please fill this uh, feedback form. It will take five minutes from you. And also if the speakers can share uh, their contacts as CSMN is requesting. If, if you would love to uh, follow up on this session, you can uh, do this on the uh, Facebook event page which was created for this webinar. I will share now the link to the Facebook event page. We will post uh, updates on this uh, link. In addition to, you will find information about the speakers. Thank you, everyone, uh, and have a good day.